So before I even start the new topic, I want to quickly recap the last topic we covered, which was respiration. So we finished respiration at the end of last term. So let's see what you remember. So we, we did equations for respiration. So we looked at aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. So what's the difference between the two? So that's the first thing you need to know, the difference between aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. Okay, so I think I know where, where um, Aron is going with this. So you say one requires physical movement. So you have to be specific when you're answering a question. So I don't know which one you're talking about. Okay, so anaerobic respiration is the one without oxygen. So that is connected to what you were, you were mentioning, Arona. So this would only occur in the body, in our cells, during a lot of physical activity. So when we're exercising, you know, running, whatever the case is, any kind of strenuous activity, that is when anaerobic respiration would kick in. So it may basically the body is not getting a good, a good supply of oxygen. So the food will be broken down in the absence of oxygen. So then aerobic respiration is really the default type of respiration that would normally occur in the body. So let's, let's quickly recap these equations. I want to make sure you know these equations. So let's look at the equation for aerobic respiration. Are you guys going to do the word equation for now? But you should know both the chemical equation and the word equation. So let's talk about aerobic respiration. So remember the raw materials and then the products on the other side. So what are the raw materials for aerobic respiration? Okay, so you definitely need oxygen and the glucose. So we have glucose plus oxygen. So then the arrow points to the product. So then what would be produced? What does respiration produce? So energy, that's the main product of respiration. And it also, yes, it will produce carbon dioxide. You're correct, Arona. <laughs> So carbon dioxide, those, these are like waste products. So they're not really what the end product would be, but they're also produced along, along the way. So carbon dioxide, we have energy and something else along with the carbon dioxide, another waste product. So think of the carbon dioxide and other substance as byproducts of respiration. But the main purpose of respiration is to produce energy. And energy is needed for all different activities in the body. No, not sweat. <laughs> not sweat. So glucose plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide plus. So remember what I said about respiration. is like the opposite to photosynthesis. So if you remember the photosynthesis equation, well, then you should remember the respiration equation because you just flip it around. Right, so water is the other product. So, the, as I said, the photosynthesis equation is aerobic respiration equation backwards. We're going to decide here and we're talking about photosynthesis. That's a little recap here. So, what would be the photosynthesis equation? What would be the raw materials? So yes, we need sunlight, and sunlight will generally come over the, the arrow. So the carbon dioxide. That's the water. So then we have the arrow, which should include sunlight, chlorophyll. So then the products now would be glucose plus oxygen. 
So I always remember in photosynthesis, plants use sunlight energy to make their food. In respiration, we have the organisms using the glucose and the oxygen. They need food. Food is gluco um, glucose is food, a type of food, an energy-rich food. So think of it this way. Respiration uses food to produce energy. Photosynthesis needs sunlight energy to produce food, and that's in plants. So you just flip the equation around. So that's the equation for aerobic respiration. So what about anaerobic respiration in, in humans? Because there are two different types. But let's, let's stick to humans, animals. And, so anaerobic respiration, what's the equation for that? So we, we already said that there is no oxygen needed. So if there's no oxygen needed, then how would this equation look? So let me just put in animals because it's different in the yeasts and plants and so on. Bacteria is a different thing. So what would be the raw materials? So no oxygen is needed, but we're going to have the same glucose being broken down. So we don't have any oxygen, so we have the arrow. Think of exercise. What do you call that substance that builds up in our muscles during exercise? Right, so the lactic acid will be the product. Plus, don't forget this, plus little energy. So glucose is broken down without oxygen to produce lactic acid and a little bit of energy. Remember, the little energy is to help keep the body going uh, when you're carrying out your strenuous activity. And the lactic acid causes what? So you have that lactic acid building up in the muscles. What does that cause? Well, not waste. Right, so it would, that, would, that would lead to the fatigue and the pain, the aches, cramping that you would feel in your muscles. Because remember, they're building up. This lactic acid is building up in the muscle cells. So this is what's going to cause that, that soreness that you would feel. So that's anaerobic respiration in animals. So let's look at the one in like yeast. How you make wines and alcoholic beverages. So that's the other equation. So you still have to know that as well. So let's use yeast for example. So we have glucose being broken down. No oxygen present. So what are the products of that type of respiration, right? So carbon dioxide is produced. So think along the lines of making baking when you're doing um, bread. So the carbon dioxide is what actually causes the bread to rise. So you remember you add yeast in bread. So you can apply that to that. So carbon dioxide plus oxygen. Yeah, so that would apply to pizzas, breads, so anything that make the dough rise. So that's where you put yeast in the dough. So when the yeast is feeding off the sugars, that is what produces the carbon dioxide. And uh, what else? What else would be produced? Okay, so you're going to get some energy, a little energy. Because remember, always remember that anaerobic respiration only produces a little energy compared to aerobic respiration. So you will see I have the energy in caps for aerobic respiration. So a lot of energy is produced in aerobic, not so much in anaerobic. So we'll be looking for, oh, in hot water. Um, oh, you're talking about the yeast. Yeah, so we're looking for another another um, product. So think of wine making. What do you find in wine? Wine and beer. Okay, yeah, the grapes. The grapes are actually um, providing the sugars for the yeast to break down to produce the carbon dioxide. And what do you what do you find in wine and and beer? 
rum, those kind of, what do you call those type of beverages? Right, so the alcohol. So alcohol, particularly the ethanol, that is what's produced along with the carbon dioxide. So you would tend to call this, this one is often known as alcoholic fermentation. So when something is fermenting, that means that there's no oxygen available. So think of it, you put, you get some grapes, crush up the grapes, and then you put in some, some yeast, cover it down in this big chamber, container, whatever, and you leave it there for a period of time, no oxygen can get in. So the yeast starts to break down the sugars in the grapes. And then that's what produces the alcohol. So that's how you make wine. So that's why it's known as alcoholic fermentation because alcohol is produced. Yeah, the, for the most part, they will use like, the yeast to help to break down the, the sugars in the grapes. So, yeah, and that's how yogurts are made too. You have bacteria breaking down the sugars in, in the, 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 the sugars in milk and so forth, because yogurt is a dairy product. Well, yeah, it can let, be left to ferment by itself, but sometimes adding the yeast, because the yeast is what's going to feed off of the, the sugars and produce the alcohol. You need something to feed off the sugars, you, you understand? So if you just leave the, the, um, the grapes there, some kind of organism, well, it's a yeast, sometimes it might be bacteria, but something has to be feeding off of the, of the um, sugars in the grapes in order to produce the carbon dioxide and the ethanol. All right, so we cover with the equations for respiration. So we have the aerobic respiration equation and then the anaerobic respiration equation. So two of them for anaerobic. So let's keep those in mind. All right, let's go back to the board now. So next question. So who can tell me four characteristics of gaseous exchange surfaces? Remember gaseous exchange? When you have oxygen coming in, carbon dioxide going out. Okay, Rona says she doesn't remember. Anyone remembers? And we looked at the alveolus. Put that on the side there. The structure of the alveolus you find in the lungs. So you're gonna need to go and review that because I'm not gonna go over that today. Okay, so you need thin membranes. The membranes, the walls need to be thin. And for obvious reasons, so that the gases can easily diffuse across, right? Rich blood supply. So you need the gases to get into the blood. So that's two. Moist, right? So moisture, you have some water, a water lining of moisture. So it makes it easier for the gases to diffuse rather than it being dry. And then one more. So if you look at the alveoli, for instance, in our lungs, there are numerous alveoli, very, very small air sacs. And there are, there are thousands of them that you will find in, in the lungs. So that creates, right, a large surface area. All right, so Leah's on a roll today <laughs> with the characteristics of gases exchange. So those are the four key characteristics you should be able to, to list. All right, so the last question. So uh, tell me three diseases or effects that are caused by cigarette smoking. So we know cigarette smoking is dangerous, can cause all kinds of health problems. So what, right? So cancer, for instance. So cancers of all different types of organs, specifically lung cancer, throat cancer. Those are the key cancers that can be affected, that can affect smokers. Okay, well, asthma isn't caused by smoking, but obviously smoking can trigger someone who, who is an asthmatic. So an asthmatic encountering smoke, they're gonna, you know, get a flare up. But smoking does not cause asthma. Okay, so Leah said chronic bronchitis. So chronic bronchitis and asthma have very similar signs and symptoms. So you have like the bronchial tubes, the bronchi inflaming. So they start to swell up, get red, the air 
the airways tend to get smaller, so you have difficulties with the air passing through. So that's what the chronic bronchitis is, which is similar in a sense to the, what happens in asthma. Okay, you said ulcers. All right, so a question. Um, let's talk about the components of cigarette smoke. So there are certain components you should know about. Yes, emphysema is another good one. So that's when you have the air sacs getting too big because the walls are broken down. So the smoke particles, they break down the walls of the air sac. So instead of it nice and small, bunched up like grits, it's too, kind of like sprawled out. <laughs> the walls are are broken down and it just looks like these large air sacs. So what, what, what are three key components of the cigarette smoke that we looked at? So tar, this tar is actually the cancerous component. So this is the part that causes cancer. So tar, so that's a serious part. So that's the car, the word hopefully you've heard before, carcinogenic, meaning it causes cancer. What other component we have? Nicotine, that's the addictive component. So this the nicotine is what would actually cause the your blood vessels to get narrow. So it can lead to a lot of heart conditions, cardiovascular problems, high blood pressure, that kind of stuff. Narcotics. Oh, narcotics are just a, a class of drugs. Oh, you mentioned fuel. Yeah, you, you had all kinds of um, chemicals that you were finding in cigarettes. More, I think one was in like lighter fuel, one of the components you were finding in lighter fuel. But another component you should know about is carbon monoxide. So what's the problem with carbon monoxide? A very dangerous gas. So don't get mixed up between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Dangerous gas. It can actually lead to death if inhaled in very large amounts. Right? So it's toxic. So the reason that it's toxic, anyone understands why it's toxic? What 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 harm it causes in the body? Alright, so it's something to do with the hemoglobin. So remember hemoglobin, and we're going to look more at hemoglobin and red blood cells when we cover the next topic. So hemoglobin usually is attracted to oxygen. Hemoglobin is supposed to transport oxygen, right? So it will result in less oxygen being transported around the body. So instead of, so, when, so think of it this way, if a cigarette smoker is smoking all the time, and they're taking in all this carbon monoxide, less oxygen is going to be trapped by the hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin have a preference for carbon monoxide. So if you have oxygen and carbon monoxide in the blood, the hemoglobin tends to be more likely to pick up the carbon monoxide. So if that's happening as a serious thing, you need the oxygen to be transported. So the hemoglobin would bind to the carbon monoxide more so than the oxygen. So you have less oxygen being transported around the body. And that's a dangerous effect. And especially if you're pregnant, if you don't have sufficient oxygen going around circulating in the blood, you can end up with miscarriages in the baby or the baby um, is underweight, you know, those kind of stuff, stillbirth. So carbon monoxide is very, very dangerous. But yes, a lot of, <laughs> there's some crazy people out there that, that smoke while, you're, while they're pregnant. I don't, it doesn't make any sense, that's correct. So smoking, taking drugs, drinking alcohol, all of those are dangerous because those substances can cross the placenta and get into the baby's blood. So that, that's the problem there. All right, so we are finished with our little recap on our respiration. So let's move on to the next topic, which is transport in humans or animals. So this is when we're going to look at, so what, why do we need a transport system, which is a circuitry system? 
So the question I'm going to throw out to you, as you can see here, why do multicellular organisms, so we as humans, animals, we're made up of many, many cells, we need a special transport system. If you compare it to, say, a bacterial cell, why, why doesn't a bacterium need, need a, a circuitry system? And this is a common question that can often come on the the exam so they want you to understand the reason for having a transport system in in multicellular organisms which are more complex okay so you need to be able to carry oxygen and nutrients to all the cells thousands and thousands millions of cells in the body so think of it this way if if we, we didn't have a transport system, it would take way too long for these materials to be transported. So with unicellular organisms, such as bacteria, amoeba, these organisms are just made up of one cell. So they can just rely on diffusion and osmosis. Remember those? So we had, we, we covered the cell transport processes exactly so the humans are the multicellular bacteria is just one cell much much simpler in structure so looking back at the trout the cell transport processes we did and as Leah said the surface area to volume ratio so these are important points that you need to understand and I find that this is another a type of question that I've seen come in the multiple choice too so you have to understand the whole meaning be behind surface area to volume ratio and what Leah was talking about. So, okay, going back to the cell transport processes, we know there's diffusion, there's osmosis, what was the last one? Let's see who remembers. AT, <laughs> that stands for All right, so active transport. So all of these will generally occur across the cell to transport the different materials, water, oxygen, nutrients, whatever the case may be. So a, a unicellular organism can just depend on these, these processes because it just made up of one cell. So the unicellular organism has a large surface area to volume ratio. So let's do this little comparison here. So we have a bacterial cell over here. So that's just one cell. And it has a small volume compared to the surface area. So if you had to work out the surface area of the bacterium is, is going to be much larger compared to the volume because the cell is very small. But now look at a human, for instance, and other animals. We are so much more complex. We have millions of cells. So that creates a larger volume. But that, that means that the surface area is going to be much smaller. So that's the problem. So large organisms, they have a small surface area to volume ratio. So that's why we can't just rely on diffusion and osmosis and active transport alone. Yes, these things would occur in the cells, but we can't just depend on that alone. We need a special transport system so the materials can be moved around the body much quickly, much more quickly. So, so that, that's the problem. So if we just relied on simple diffusion, it would take way too long for the materials to be transported. So always keep that in mind. So small organisms have a small volume, large surface area. Well, the larger organisms, their volume is much larger compared to the surface area. So we would tend to talk about small surface area to volume ratio. So that's the reason why we need a transport system in, in multicellular organisms. They're much more complex, more cells. So we need to get the materials transported quickly. So we kind of touched on what type of materials would be transported. So apart from oxygen and nutrients, anything else comes to mind? So oxygen, we talked about the nutrients. So that's what Rona has said earlier. 
So what, what are some other materials that will be transported in the, in the body? So you have good substances needed and then substances that would eventually need to be removed. Like we have substances that would need to be removed. Okay, so proteins, so not proteins, what do you call the small the units of proteins, the building blocks for proteins? Because think of digestion, so we're going to connect some of what we did before. So water, yes, as a nutrient. So proteins and water, there are nutrients, but aside, aside from nutrients, what, 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 what are some other materials that, that may come to mind? <laughs> all right, Ron, you listen, all the nutrients there. A starch would not be transported. All right, so let, let me let me let me make it clear. So when we when we talk about nutrients being transported in the in the body, they have to be nutrients that were small that would have been digested. So water is small enough. Vitamins. So that's that's a little side note. Nutrients being transported. So starch is not going to be transported. So mentioning blood because blood is a transport medium. So think of water. We have amino acids, so not proteins, because proteins are the large molecules. Remember, they had to be digested. Right, so then sugars, right? So sugars, which is like glucose. So think of the, 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 the final products of digestion. So they're now small enough to get into the blood. So you should not, you would not have starch being transported in the blood. You're not going to have glycogen. You're not going to have protein. So think of very small. So go back to digestion. So we have water, amino acids, sugars, vitamins are already small, minerals. So those are substances that will be transported in the blood. Those are nutrients. So apart from the nutrients, so let's look at some of these other materials that the blood would carry that needs to be transported all around the body. So we already touched on oxygen, water, and all the other nutrients. So we also have hormones. Anyone can tell me what hormones do? So these are useful substances that the body needs. So we've heard you hear about hormones a lot. Okay, so yeah, they can have um, some kind of control over your emotions. So think of hormones as regulators in the body. So they regulate different activities in the body. And we're going to look at hormones later on. Um, we're going to look at the menstrual cycle. You'll see a group of hormones that are responsible for controlling the menstrual cycle, right? So they, they control different activities in the body. The nervous system and the endocrine system are closely connected. So when you think of hormones, that is the endocrine system. So think of insulin, what does that control? So that would control, like reducing the amount of blood sugar, right? Good. So those are examples of hormones. Insulin, you have estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, all those are different hormones. So we can look at that later on. Antibodies, anyone knows what antibodies do? So you see, apart from oxygen and nutrients, these are other useful substances that need to be transported in the body. Good, so antibodies, you think immune system. So they help to fight off the foreign invaders, so bacteria, viruses, all that. Good, so fight off disease, infections. So apart from that, you also have plasma proteins, and we're going to look at this more when we do blood clotting. So these are proteins that help the blood to clot. Yes, and we're going to look at blood type later on, especially when we do section C. You're going to learn a little more about blood type and compatibility and all of that. And then everyone should be familiar with enzymes. What do enzymes do? So we did that when we did nutrition. So 
Okay, so they help. So some enzymes will help in digestion. So remember, there are different types of en enzymes in the body. So we only focus on the digestive enzymes. But enzymes generally, well, so what do they do in digestion? So yes, they help break down the the foods from large the large molecules to smaller molecules. But if you had to give a general definition for enzymes, well, what do enzymes generally do? Okay, good. All right, so Tanisha got it. So they speed up reactions. So they're responsible for speeding up chemical reactions in your body. I know for the most part, when you think of enzymes, you would think of digestion. Yeah, so catalyst is the other word there. So they're biological catalysts. So they help to speed up the chemical reactions. So, so all of these, you see, apart from oxygen and water and other nutrients, hormones, antibodies, plasma proteins, enzymes, all of these are useful substances that need to be transported in the body. And then you're seeing now harmful waste substances that also need to be transported. And then eventually either broken down or gotten rid of through excretion. So carbon dioxide, alcohol and other drugs, pathogens, all of these are transported in the body as well. Nitrogenous waste such as urea. So those are the types of materials that would be transported. All right, so now you understand what what type of substances are transported in the body. So we're going to look at the circulatory system now, which is the transport system in humans and other animals. So it's made up of three components. So you probably might know already. I have some clues there on the board already. But one clue for sure. So three components found in the circulatory system. So these are the three structures that make up the circulatory system. So think think of what 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 we need to get the materials transported around the body. Oh no, not respiration. <laughs> don't don't look on that side. <laughs> the clue the clue is on the side with dealing with transport. So three components of the circuitry system. So when you think of the circuitry system, what comes to mind? Okay, so blood, that's one component. All right, so you mentioned veins, which are blood vessels. So blood, blood vessels, that's two components. Then the main, main part, right, the heart. So when you're thinking of the circuitry system, those are the three components that should come to mind. So the heart, blood vessels, and then the blood that is carried in the, the blood vessels. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the heart first of all. Then we're going to go on to do the blood vessels and then the blood. So let's, I don't know... <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna label the heart. You need to know how to label the diagram of the heart, both external and internal. I'm not sure if you any of you have covered the heart, but what I'll do is just bring up a diagram just to, by chance. So this is the inside of the heart. Okay, good. So you know there are four chambers. So you're correct, Arona. So four chambers. So let's see, let's see if we can label. So it looks, this is a diagram. It may look a little complex, lots of labels shown here. So we have four chambers. I'm gonna highlight the chambers. Number nine, seven, two, and number three. Yeah, it's a, it's a very complex di diagram. So the, the heart, you have, you have a number of different parts that you need to know how to label. So the chamber, the four chambers, then you will notice you have some valves. So valves are like these little flaps. 
think of them as door doorways to help prevent blood from flowing backwards. So it's literally a little flap. So A, B, C, and D, those represent the valves of the heart. So you might hear about heart valves. Some, somebody might have a heart valve condition. So it just means that there's some problem with the valves. So if the valves don't operate as they should, the blood might flow back to where it came from. You want blood going in one direction only in the heart. So if it comes in, you don't want it going back from where it came from. So that's the function of the valves. So we have four chambers. So that's doing a little summary here. Then we're going to get to the notes. So four chambers. And you can see that the, the heart is pretty much divided into two, two halves. You have the left side and the right side. So typically when you're looking at when you're looking at the screen, the left side is the right side, the right side is the left. Same thing if you're looking at the diagram on the exam paper. So whatever is normally right will be left. So for instance here, this is the right side. Part. And then over here would be the left side. So that's another key thing to know. So we have four chambers, four valves, and we're going to get to the enabling of the heart, the actual names, because there's a lot of names to remember. So this is definitely an area that you need to review often. All right, so all right, let's go to the actual, let's go to the actual notes. So first, let me show you the outside of the heart. So when you look at someone's, so if, you know, a heart, if it was supposed to pull the heart directly from the chest, this is what it would typically look like. Yeah, so the left side by your right hand, right, the left. So just kind of flip it around. So here we have the outside of the heart. And the key things that you should know, and you should be able to label the heart on the outside as well as the inside. So we have right. Um, so we have the the key artery in the heart, which is the aorta. This is a one of the. This is the largest artery in the body. So to recognize the aorta, you typically will see it is it literally looks very large and you will tend to see branches coming from it. So if you look at it close, you see like there's branches because the aorta is responsible for taking blood from the heart to multiple other organs of the body. So you're going to see these different blood. So these, these different branches represent arteries that will be connected to other organs in the body. So the aorta is one of the key blood vessels of the heart that you need to know the label. So it's significantly the largest artery in the body. So then we have the, it says here the left pulmonary artery. When you when the left pulmonary artery, then you have the left pulmonary veins. So always remember when you see that word pulmonary, it means connected to the lungs. So the artery and the veins are connected to the lungs. So that word pulmonary means related to lungs. Okay, we're gonna get to that. So you're seeing veins and arteries on the outside. We're gonna get to the, those are the coronary arteries, a very important part of the external part of the heart. So here we have the left atrium, left ventricle. Focus more on those parts when we look at the inside, but you can still be, you should still be able to label them from the outside. So there are four chambers. You have the left and the right atria, the left and the right ventricle. But we're gonna get back to those um, chambers shortly. But what I really wanna focus on for the outside part is the coronary arteries because these are essential for the functioning of the heart itself. 
So if something goes wrong with these coronary arteries, it can lead to a heart attack. So just like the heart, the heart is the, the pump, the muscular pump, responsible for pumping blood to all the different organs and cells and tissues of the body. But the heart still needs to have its own blood supply. So that is where these coronary arteries come from. So these coronary arteries would supply the cardiac muscle. So that's what the heart is made up of. It supplies the cardiac muscle with the oxygen and the food, the nutrients that the cells, the cardiac muscle cells need to contract. So that's how the heart would function. If the heart is pumping, it's actually because the muscles are contracting. So the muscles actually um, contract to allow the heart to pump. So the coronary arteries help supply that cardiac muscle that you're seeing all over the heart. So all this is cardiac muscle tissue. So the whole heart is made up of cardiac muscle tissue. So the cardiac muscle tissue needs to have its own supply of nutrients and oxygen. <laughs> no, 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 not so extreme, Arona. Not if it skips a beat. I'm sure we've all had experiences where the heart might have skipped a beat. It's not that that serious. <laughs> you know, when you actually, I don't know if you know this, but you know, when you actually sneeze, your heart stops for a little while. So each time you sneeze, your heart will temporarily, you know, kind of, kind of pause. Nothing major that will cause you to die or anything like that. But that happens. But what, what would be serious is if, so if I put, draw a line. So for instance, let me zoom it in a bit. So if we were to have a blockage in the coronary artery, one of these coronary arteries. So say I'm putting these two lines here to represent an area in the coronary artery where there's a blockage. So maybe there's a blood clot. Um, I'm not sure if you're, you've heard of atherosclerosis. So when you have a lot of fat, fatty plaques building up in the arteries. Yeah, it's a long, long word. All it means is that when you consume a lot of fats, you know, high cholesterol, these fats build up in the inner walls of the artery. Atherosclerosis, <laughs> as what it's called, atherosclerosis. So if this occurs in the coronary artery, then that could be serious. It can cause the opening of the artery to be very small. So think of like similar to with, with the nicotine, it cause the narrowing of the arteries. So it causes the opening of the arteries to be very small, so less blood can flow through. So it can lead to high blood pressure, the, the heart has to work harder. So any kind of blockage, anything that gets into the way of the blood flowing through can be serious and can lead to a heart attack. Because if the blood cannot flow through, so this is where the problem occurs, if the blood cannot flow through because of this blockage here, Therefore, the cardiac muscle would not get the oxygen it needs. So the cardiac muscle in this area, so this is where that artery would supply the cardiac muscles. So it wouldn't get oxygen, it wouldn't get food. So eventually the muscle in that area is going to start to die. So just like if, you know, we, we go very long without oxygen or food, water, whatever the case is, we, we eventually would die. So it's the same thing here with the cardiac muscle. So if there's a blockage in the coronary artery, that can contribute to a heart attack. That's essentially what, what causes a heart attack, a blockage in the coronary artery. So blood cannot flow through and transport the nutrients and the oxygen to the cardiac muscle. So making sense, everyone is with me. So that, that's how how a heart attack can actually be the cause. So that is the outside part of the of the heart. 
So now let's look at the inside. So this is when you really need to, to know how to label. So we have the four chambers, as Arona said. Left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. So remember the heart is divided into left side and right side. So you're going to have an atrium on each side and a ventricle on each side. And you will notice that it's color coded. That's really to help you to understand the type of blood flowing through. So you notice that on the left hand side is red. So the red indicates that the type of blood passing through the heart is rich in oxygen. So normally blood that is rich in oxygen would tend to be a brighter red. Now on the right side, you notice it's blue. So that's just showing you that on the right side, the blood going through the right side is actually deoxygenated. It doesn't have oxygen. So blood that's deoxygenated, they have it hi highlighted as a blue as blue, but it's not gonna the blood is not gonna actually look blue per se, but it's gonna look like a, a, a darker color. So they just use blue to show that it's lacking oxygen. Oh boy, <laughs> if you have really dark blood, you might have a breathing problem. Um, I can't say if you have a breathing problem if the blood is dark, because blood can get dark for different reasons. You know, when, when blood is exposed, obviously it, it, it eventually gets a little darker. You know, when you start bleeding and you at least see blood out there for a while, it gets darker. But generally speaking, that's why the, that, that's why the heart is, is color-coded as it is. So you're going to see the red side and the blue side. So just keep that in mind. So, so let's look now. So I'm going to wrap up here with going through the flow of blood through the heart. And a key thing you need to understand is that blood actually flows through the heart twice in one heartbeat. So every time your heart beats, and there's a cardiac cycle, and there's a cardiac cycle, the blood is going through your heart twice. So it goes to the left side and the right side pretty much at the same time. So what I'll do maybe in the next class, I'll bring a video clip so you can actually see the heart moving in action and you see exactly how the blood is entering and leaving at the same time. So you see here we have the right side highlighted in blue, the red side highlighted in red. But you can't be too comfortable with looking at the color because in on the exam paper, there's not gonna have, they're not going to have color on the paper. Everything is black and white. So you need to know the size and what type of blood goes through without any color. So let's look at the left side. So we're going to start the flow of blood from the left side and we're going to look at the different parts. So I'm just going to break this down as simple as possible. All right, so on the left side, Zoom it in a little bit. Okay, so so let's start from the left side, and we're going to start from the the lungs. So remember, blood comes, remember we just covered the respiratory system. We know the lungs is responsible for taking in oxygen and breathing out the carbon dioxide. So blood coming from the lungs obviously should be rich in oxygen. So that oxygen rich blood coming from the lungs is now going to the left side of the heart through the pulmonary veins. So this is the first set of vessels you need to know to label. So the pulmonary veins, so you're seeing two of them. Sometimes you may only see one being labeled. But the pulmonary vein takes oxygen-rich blood from the lungs to the left atrium. So this is the first chamber on the left side. So pulmonary 
vein states the blood to the left atrium. So when the blood flows from the left atrium, you see it's going to pass the first set of valves, which is the bicuspid valve. And you have to know the difference between the bicuspid valve on the left and the tricuspid valve on the right. So remember what the valves do. They prevent backflow. You don't want the blood going back from where it came from. So th always think of them as little flaps or doors to prevent the blood from flowing backwards. So the bicuspid valve on the left, that's responsible for separating the left atrium from the left ventricle. So you see the atria is always on top, ventricles are the bottom chambers. So these are the chambers we're talking about. Yeah, the blood will go back to the heart, but you don't want the blood coming in to flow backwards from where it came from. You want the blood going in one direction. So just follow the arrows. You don't want it flowing backwards. One direction only. So we have the blood from the lungs, restrain oxygen, come into the left atrium, passes the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle at the bottom. So then that blood is going to be pumped up through the aorta. So remember we talked about the aorta, the largest artery in the body. And you're seeing the different branches. So these are going to go to the different organs of the body. So all the other organs of the body, your liver, your stomach, lungs, whatever, all the other organs of the body. Well, not so much the lungs, because the lungs have their own, their own transport vessel, their own pulmonary artery and pulmonary veins, but all the other organs of the body, you'll see these branches here, those represent arteries that will connect to the different other areas of the body. So aorta takes the blood away from the heart to all the parts of the body. So remember it's carrying what type of blood, let's see if you're following. So what type of blood the aorta carries? Right, so oxygen rich blood. So remember red, oxygen rich. So oxygenated blood is now going to all parts of the body. Because remember all of our organs and tissues need, need oxygen. So that's where the aorta is going to be taking the blood. So through the branches there. So then when the, the blood is offloaded at the different organs, it's going to release nutrients, oxygen to these organs. So then it needs to return to the, the heart again. So it came through the left side, carrying oxygen rich blood. So after it offloads the oxygen, to the cells and the organs of the body. Now it returns to the right side of the body, the right side of the heart, through the vena cava. And you will notice that the vena cava has two branches. So we have the superior vena cava. So that's blood from the upper body. So anything above your chest, so your head, neck, you know, that region up there above your chest, above the heart, so that's the superior vena cava from the upper body. And then the inferior vena cava from the lower body. So a vena cava is a large vein, the largest vein in the body. So just like the aorta is the largest artery, the vena cava is the largest vein in the body. So the vena cava is responsible for taking the blood now lacking oxygen so it's deoxygenated blood now coming through the vena cava back to the heart now on the right side. So it goes into the right atrium, passes the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. So we have the other valve there. And then up to the pulmonary artery. So pulmonary artery takes deoxygenated blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen again. That's the whole reason why it's going back to the lungs. So this blood does not have in any oxygen. It, ha it's more, it has in a lot of carbon dioxide. So it's like an exchange that needs to occur when it gets back to the lungs. 
So it goes to the lungs, collect oxygen or flow the carbon dioxide so we, we can breathe out. So then the whole cycle begins again. So once that blood re returns to the lungs, then the blood from the lungs, now carrying oxygen, goes back to the heart again. So we're back to square one. So that pretty much sums up the flow of blood through the heart twice. So it's coming through the left side and the right side at the same time. So I'll stop there. So I know there's a lot, <laughs> a lot to take in. So we're going to pick up from here on, on Wednesday. So please make, be sure to just look through the notes on the heart just to come prepared for Wednesday's class. So we're going to go back through labeling the heart again and look at some past paper questions on the heart. So come prepared for that. <laughs> yeah, so I'll try to bring a video clip of the heart for next class. So you actually see it in action and how the blood is entering both sides of the heart at the same time. So definitely review, review the heart for then. All right, so that is it for today. If you found this video helpful, feel free to subscribe, like, and share. And don't forget to hit that notification bell.